The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to log in to the system. You are uh, waiting for CPEC's presentation of the teenage brain. We're just going to ba wait about a minute or two for everybody to have a chance to log in. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. Good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Davistein. I'm the chair of the Halton Catholic District School Board's Parent Involvement Committee, CPEC. And welcome to our Parent Speaker Series for the spring of 2014. With me as well is uh, Lisa Koster, uh, Barb Belanger, and Rosemary Stegg. Tonight, we are going to have a presentation on the teenage brain. And that is by our guest speaker, Dr. Garfield Jeannie Newman. Um, Dr. Garfield's reputation as a dynamic and provocative speaker is widespread, and requests for his services have taken him from Asia to the Middle East, Europe, the Caribbean, and across North America. Garfield's interest in effective teaching and learning has led him to actively exploring the challenges and opportunities presented by teaching and learning in the digital age. Dr. Garfield has spoken across Canada and internationally on critical thinking, brain-compatible classrooms, curriculum design, and effective assessment practice, and nurturing 21st century skills in a digital world. In addition to his work at the University of Toronto and delivering workshops, Dr. Garfield has also authored several articles, chapters in books, and seven textbooks, and has taught in the faculties of education at York University and the University of British Columbia. During this webinar, if you have any questions, for Dr. Garfield. On the bottom right of your screen, you will have a little tab. Well, it could also be towards, you know, it's somewhere in the um, GoToMeeting window. You have a tab that says questions. You can type questions in there if you have any technical questions for us, the organizers, or for Dr. Garfield. And at the end, we will pick some questions when, if time permitting, to ask Dr. Garfield at that time. Any further questions, we will collate and present to Dr. Garfield, and he could email those back to us at a later time. 
please also note that this session is being recorded and will be available on CPIC's YouTube page, which is Halton CPIC. So without much further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Dr. Garfield. Thanks, Josh. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful spring, finally, that it's here. Um, you'll see in front of you a, an image, a cartoon, by Mark Parisi on the teen brain. And, and just as I'm doing some introductions, uh, I want you to take a look at some of the details of his tongue-in-cheek drawing of the teen brain. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, my, my background is in education. I work at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Education. And my interest in, in teen brain research um, emerged a number of years ago as in, from an educator's lens of how do we use what we're learning about the teen brain to effectively engage with teenagers. So I, as you look at uh, the image, I often ask people in presentations on the teen brain just to assess how effectively the cartoonist has captured the teen brain. So those of you living with a, a preteen or a teen or have raised a teen can take a look at some of the images and, and I'll draw your attention to a couple of them. The, the very tiny judgment gland just behind the eyes. Uh, I really like the, the yin-yang, the love for, par for parents, disdain for parents, that, that tension that students have, the, the memory for chores and homework, the tiny one beside that yin-yang. The, the ability to see it in public with parents at the back of the brain, the tiny one. Now, th this is tongue-in-cheek, and uh, I think it's interesting to look at and think about you know, what would you change in it. Uh, I've had some people tell me that every episode of The Simpsons might be replaced now by another show. But it gets that the, the idea uh, to before we started the session, uh, someone was commenting on all the answers part of the brain. So a bit of tongue-in-cheek um, look at, at the team brain to start us off this evening. I'm going to uh, have us look at, sorry, just advancing my, my slide here. I want to show you these, these two comments that, that I came across a few years ago. Uh, Don Tapscott wrote a book called Growing Up Digital. Uh, about a decade before this, he wrote a book called Growing Up Digital. And that first book focused on what does it mean for children growing up in a digital world. And he wrote this book as a follow-up book a decade later in which he was looking at what has been the implications for children. So looking at the children he wrote about a decade earlier, now they're young adults. Uh, what did it mean for them? I'll come back to that in a moment. But you'll notice that he has a very positive view of teenagers. He said the evidence is strong that net geners are the smartest generation ever, that they've been given the opportunity to fulfill their inherent human intellectual potential as no other generation. So Don Tapscott is very positive, and, and this is based on a $4 million study and interviews with teens and so on. The same week that I read this in his book, when I was reading this, I picked up my Toronto Star, and the headline on the Toronto Star read, Profs Blast Lazy Frosh. And the subheading you can see on the screen here, Wikipedia generation is lazy and unprepared for university's rigors. So I was intrigued by this because on the one hand I had Don Tapscott's book telling me kids today are the smartest generation ever. And I had a survey of university professors saying kids today are lazy and unprepared. And this led me to wonder you know, which of these has more merit? Which of these uh, would, would be a better description of today's youth and teens? Or do they in fact fit together? So I'll just give you 30 seconds just to think about that. Are these opposites of these, you know, a very positive or a negative view? Or in fact, can they coexist? Do these, do these two statements fit together? Just let's reflect on that for 30 seconds. Now, from doing a number of parent presentations face to face, I, I can tell you my experience has been that many parents feel that these are not actually opposites, that in fact they both can coexist. And normally what I hear are things like this, that, that you can be both smart and lazy, that uh, today kids can easily access information, but that they may not have the perseverance, or concerns that kids can access lots of information, but they don't filter it well. Sometimes we hear a more positive spin, that uh, kids today can use technology to work smarter, not harder, that they can quickly find information, 
not spend hours in the library because they can get it from home. It's an interesting question that it raises. And by the way, if you are intrigued, Don Tapscott's book, uh, Chapter Four, is devoted to the to the brain, the, the digital brain, basically. That that what he points out, and we know from the neuroscience, is that our brains are shaped by how we interact with our environment. And so children growing up in a digital environment, their brains are literally being wired differently than a generation before. And, and that, that, as a result, how they learn and how they process is different. And chapter four is a really interesting, if you don't have time for the whole book, just reading chapter four is quite interesting to, uh, to, to consider how your child's brain is being wired as a result of growing up in the digital world. And, and by the way, the last page uh, in that chapter are seven things parents can do to help build a sharper mind. So it's a nice summary of what some of the research is telling us and ways that we can respond to that. I'm going to show you a few other samples. Just to, If out of this evening's talk you're, you're intrigued and want to read a bit more, I'm going to make a few recommendations. A couple of years ago, uh, National Geographic, and you can find this uh, in the National Geographic article about two, three years ago, I think two years ago, uh, they devoted uh, the cover story, as you can see here, to the teenage brain. It was a very interesting summary of much of the new research going on in the teen brain that actually is adopting a very positive look, that, that much of what might frustrate us as parents, so often we might feel frustrated uh, by uh, the way teens behave and so on, can be explained by what they describe as the maturing brain as it moves from independence, sorry, from dependence to independence. That, that much of the teenage angst that we experience as parents uh, is students or our children testing boundaries, pushing boundaries, trying to see, but notice they're moving from being dependent on us as parents and as adults during the earlier years to starting to venture out on their own and, and try things out. And, and the research is suggesting this is a normal and healthy part uh, with our guidance. So this is a very interesting and readable and you know, short enough article. Another book that I want to recommend, Barbara Stroke. Uh, Barbara Stroke is a science journalist in, in New York and in writing her book, The Primal Teen, uh, she essentially traveled across North America interviewing neuroscientists and put together, I think, a very readable book on the teen brain by looking at it and, and telling the stories in a very anecdotal manner. So, so in each chapter she'll open with a story of her children or children that she knew or friends' children and you know what might have happened or a reaction they had and then she'll use the neuroscience to help understand so why that reaction, why that, that behavior. And so I think in reading it you'll find lots of bits of this book that, are, that you identify with and it's quite a readable book. Another book I, I found quite enlightening, um, Luann Brizendine's book the female brain was, was quite fascinating. Uh, Luann Brizendine points out that uh, often we talk about, about brain research and teen brains or any other brains, we often lump together male and female brains. Her book attempts to, to separate, to, to show that in fact uh, male and female brains are wired differently and, and how they're wired impacts how we might respond. I found this an absolutely enlightening book. I have a daughter who turned 18 last Saturday. I have a son who's turning 25 this Friday. Uh, raising them is, is, is very different. In the, in the book, The Female Brain, Luann Brizendine starts at conception and then the book goes right through to, to old age. Uh, for example, one of the first revelations for me is that at conception we all have female brains. So Luann Brizendine points out that at conception all brains are female and that the amount of uh, testosterone released in fetal development is going to determine the maleness of a child. She will then go through each section of life, so toddlers, um, you know, children, at early, you know, adolescents, uh, a chapter on the mummy brain, a chapter on the postmenopausal brain, for example. I mean, you could take this book and read the chapter or the section on your child as they grow up. It's, it's quite enlightening to think about what's going on in, in, in that female brain. And I have to tell you, my wife read the book after I did, and she said, you know, I learned as much about your brain as you would about a female brain, because you can't read a book on the female brain without, by uh, implication, understanding a bit about the male brain. So very, very enlightening. Uh, one, one story I want to share with you that, I, that, that shows I, where I found this enlightening. I'm sure many of you have heard of the term fight-or-flight response. So the term fight-or-flight response 
it was coined in 1934. So that's a, a you know an 80-year-old concept. And the idea of fight or flight is that when the brain encounters a threat of some kind, it releases adrenaline and cortisol into the brain. Our, uh, keep in mind that a basic premise of the brain is our brains are built for survival. So if we feel under attack or threatened in any way, our brain readies us to defend ourselves in some way or to get to safety. So for example, um, if I'm crossing the street and suddenly a car comes out of nowhere, I don't pause and use my frontal lobes to weigh my options and carefully think through the best choice. I get out of the way. Adrenaline and cortisol uh, help me to rush and get out of the way, my heart pounding. And when I calm down, I can think about what just happened. But in the midst of danger, our brains get us to safety. Now, Luanne Brizendine points out that fight or flight is actually a male response to aggression. And she answers for me a lifelong question that I had. And that is, I've always wondered, how come women go to the bathroom in groups? Because men don't do that. If I'm at a session and I say, I need to go to the washroom, you want to join me? I can tell you, rarely would a man say, yes, I'd love to go to the bathroom with you. And yet often women go off to the bathroom in groups, certainly teenage girls do. Why is that? Now, you might think that, you know, I just saw a rabbit and I'm off on a tangent, but in fact, there's a reason for, for me linking these two. You see, fight or flight response, as I said, is a male response. If you think about this, when women enter adolescence and their childbearing years, one of the most important roles, most important functions is to protect and care for the children. If you're holding two children and you encounter a threat, a danger of some kind, Women are not going to set down the children to fight off the threat. And running quickly to get the safety with two children isn't a very viable option. So fight and flight is not really a very viable way to women, for women to defend themselves. Instead, Len Brizendine points out that the woman's response to aggression is called tend and befriend. So tend and befriend. In other words, by going to the bathroom in groups, it's not about going to the bathroom, it's about social bonding, it's about that networking. Think about how many women are more likely to call a friend if they're feeling stressed, or to call their mother, or to be in touch. Men will tend to internalize, women will tend to reach out. Because for women, through an evolutionary biology lens, safety has always been in having friends or supports around you. It's an important part. And by the way, for teen girls growing up, being isolated or ostracized is a very difficult place for teen girls. For them being ostracized is very hard emotionally because that's where their safety lies. It lies in having someone to support. By the way, another book that I just don't have on the screen, but uh, Lise Elliott, that's L-I-S-E, Lise Elliott, wrote a book called Pink Brain, Blue Brain. And in a similar way, it looks at at how male brains and female brains are wired differently and what it means for raising a boy or a girl or supporting or educating and so on. I'm going to show you one last book and then we're going to talk just for a few minutes about this book. This book is called Mindset. My apologies for the clarity of this image. The author is Carol, C-A-R-O-L, Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. So Carol Dweck wrote a book Mindset. Again, a real interesting book study that Carol includes in, in her and, and in her book. Now Carol, by the way, is a psychologist at Columbia University. And this is one of the studies she conducted. And the question she asked, does a child's belief about intelligence have anything to do with their academic success? And to look into this, she took a group of 100 students in grade 7 who were all struggling in math. And she divided them into two groups. One group she taught them strategies for how to study, how to prepare for their math test. To the other group, she delivered a workshop on intelligence in the brain. And essentially what she pointed out is that intelligence isn't fixed. You're not born with a certain amount of intelligence. Often people, because of things like the IQ test and so on, assume that you're born with a certain amount of intelligence. But in fact, what Carol Dweck pointed out is that with new experiences, with more practice, the more we practice, the more experiences we have, the more new connections are grown in the brain, that in fact you can grow smarter over time. And so you can see from this screen that students understood that as you experience, learn, practice, you grow new connections, your brain gets denser, you grow smarter. What was fascinating 
to, to Carol Dweck, is at the end, when the students were, wrote the same exam, the students who had taught you can grow smarter through hard work, through practice, and so on, did better than the students who had been taught how to study for a math test. So what was interesting is to one group, she taught them how to study for the test. The other group, she taught them they could grow smarter with hard work. The group taught how to study underperformed. They were way outperformed by the students who had been taught you can grow smarter over time. And this is the, the essence or the genesis of, of her book mindset. So here's just a couple of things. She identifies two types of mindsets, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So I want you to note a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. In a fixed mindset, students see intelligence as something they're born with. So if you look at the left here, success or failure is what's expected. So even a top performing child could have a fixed mindset. If they say, well, I'm an A student, I'm expected to pass, they have a fixed mindset. School's about proving your worth. It's about showing you're an A student. We will know this when, when a child is given a choice of 10 topics that they can do a project on in school. Children with a fixed mindset will pick the topic they're most likely to be successful with. So notice they will pick the topic that they're going to get the A because that's what they're supposed to do. A growth mindset challenges challenges are embraced. A setback is a challenge to be embraced. It excites and it motivates. That given a list of topics to pick from, a child with a growth mindset picks the topic they know little about because they want to learn more. You know, they, they don't pick a topic I already know about, they pick a topic they want to learn about. And they understand that hard work is what pays off and that school is an opportunity to grow that intelligence. By the way, note on the other side again, people with a fixed mindset a challenge is something they avoid. So if something's not easy, they quit because as in a fixed mindset, I can't do this. And by the way, think about, for those of you listening, think about your own children. How many times have you heard something like this? Well, I'm just no good at. And then you can fill in the blank. Children will say, well, I'm just not a good writer. I'm just no good in art. I'm just not good at math. That's a fixed mindset. And it leads kids to throwing up their hands and saying, well, I can't do this. What we want to do is nurture a growth mindset. We want to nurture a mindset that when I encounter a challenge, that's why I work harder. And by the way, the final chapter, th this is a, a wonderful book, and it's actually not an education book or a parenting book. She has a chapter on business leaders, growth mindsets versus fix, on, on great athletes. Uh, Michael Jordan is a classic growth mindset who doesn't get drafted tops, didn't get into the university he chose, he just kept working and working. Um, the final chapter, by the way, is called Great Parents, Great Teachers. And it provides some advice on what we can do as parents to help develop a growth mindset in our children. And, and let me just give you a quick example. Our daughter, who, who I mentioned uh, turned, uh, had a birthday last week, our, our daughter plays piano, and, and we've always been quite proud of how well she plays piano. And so we would often praise her. We would say, you know, we're so proud of how well you play. You're so talented. We're so, we're so proud of your talent. And one night a few years ago, our daughter turned to us and said, well, if I'm so talented, why do I have to practice every night? At that point, we realized we've been accidentally coaching a fixed mindset. Because notice what we had been telling her. We were proud of her intelligence. We were proud of her talent. In other words, we're proud of what you have. We realized that we were accidentally coaching the wrong mindset. And so we've changed our language. When Nikita does well in piano or in school, we say, wow, that practice has really paid off. You played beautifully. So notice what we're shifting is to express pride in how well she's doing because of her hard work. That if she does well on an assignment or a test, we celebrate the hard work that paid off in her success. This has shifted the conversation from being proud of her innate intelligence, which is a fixed mindset, to proud of how hard she's worked to develop her intelligence, which is a growth mindset. So the way we talk to our kids can influence what, what mindset they develop, and it has a huge difference in outcome on the type of learner and type of adult they'll become. So I'm going to touch on, a, on a, a fairly quickly uh, four key areas in teen brain research that we know that impacts on student learning. And one is, I'm just going to, this is more of a school issue, but I want to raise it with you. Um, sometimes you hear people talking about brain-based learning and education, and I've come to realize when, when asked a question about that, that it 
it's actually not a very useful term because someone pointed out to me it isn't all learning brain-based, that you actually can't learn except brain-based. And so, in fact, the term we want to think about is brain compatible. And I want you to think about this in a home environment. Brain compatible learning is when learning takes place in a way consistent with what we know about how the brain naturally learns. Brain antagonistic is trying to learn in an environment that's not conducive to how the brain learns. So, for example, we know that movement helps trigger thinking. Sitting still for too long will inhibit a student's ability to transfer information and to process information. We know that a lot of distractions will inhibit. So we want to think about, have I created a safe place, a place where a child can, can concentrate uh, when they do their learning? Or have I, are the conditions where the child's learning uh, causing them to have to struggle to do the learning? Now, so I'm, I wanted to share this, this quick study with you. What does it mean to be engaged? Interesting study around student engagement where they found that students, in fact, were more engaged in arts and tech than in academic classes, more engaged in science and math. Let me just pause there for a moment. And what this seems to suggest is that being engaged has not, so not as much to do with being entertained as much as it has to do with being hands-on, being relevant, that the children need to see relevance in what they're learning. They need to be actively involved in the learning. So rather than passively receiving information, they need to be actively involved processing it. They need to see how it connects, how it's relevant to them. By the way, note they're more engaged in, in math than history or social science. That's a relevance issue. And the fact that they're more engaged writing a test than watching a movie, because a test requires concentration. So the three factors that influ influence student engagement. Does the child see relevance? Is the child actively involved? Does it require that the child concentrate? Those are three factors that show us the depth of student engagement and therefore the depth of learning. This is something in, in, uh, in the work that, that I've been doing with some colleagues is looking at an engagement taxonomy, thinking about when we're engaged, you know, we want to get beyond at the bottom, this works from the bottom up, that at the bottom, I might be merely compliant, that I'm willing to do the task. If I'm interested, I'm more likely to complete the task. If I see value in the task, I'm more likely to find it interesting. If I'm given a challenge, I'm more likely to get, to, to get engaged with the task. So, so what we're trying to think in education these days about how can we create tasks and opportunities for kids that will engage them actively in relevant ways that pushes a, a deep, deep understanding. And just a couple of things for kids growing up in the digital world. I wanted just to show you, this is from, as you can see at the bottom, a, tome, a poem by T.S. Eliot called The Chorus of the Rock, or, or sometimes just known as The Rock, written 80 years ago, 1934. And in his poem he asked, where is the life we've lost in living? Where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we've lost in information? And I show this to you just because many of our children today are growing up in a world overwhelmed you know, with social media, with internet, with 24-7 you know, access to information. They're overwhelmed. Are they more knowledgeable than, than children were 20 years ago or a couple of generations ago? And I'd suggest to you that although kids may have more access to information, if they don't know how to select it, if they don't know how to think about it, if they don't know how to use it in a thoughtful way, they're not wiser and they may not be more knowledgeable. They may just have more information. Uh, by the way, uh, June 5th, we'll be doing a follow-up to this evening session, which will focus on, based on what we're talking about this evening, how do we help our children be good critical thinkers, good, good uh, thoughtful users of information, so that so what, what's being raised here uh, is, not a, is not the problem. Uh, by the way, this just translates this into the poem into, into learning. That data is when information, isolated bits of information is presented. When we link together, when we connect those pieces, we have a body of information. But unless the child starts to understand, interacts with, makes sense of it, it doesn't become knowledge. And knowledge becomes wisdom when students see trends or patterns over time and they're going to act on, they're going to use what they've learned. Um, in the Catholic school system, an example of this is the Catholic graduate expectations, that, that if children are learning about a topic, information, but not deeply understanding, we don't build knowledge. If they have knowledge but don't, aren't reflective about how they'll use that to live a Catholic life, 
we haven't built wisdom. So what we want to be looking at in, in, in supporting our children both in classrooms and as parents, how do I help kids make sense of overwhelming amounts of information so they build knowledge and hopefully we nurture wisdom? Okay, a couple of key things that we know from, from the brain research. First, emotion is the gatekeeper to learning. So one of the things that we know is that emotion has a huge impact on whether or not a child learns and learns deeply and retains that information. And there's two sides, shut down learning. So remember I said to you when we began that the brain is primarily built for survival. First and foremost, if we encounter danger, we get to safety. If the child, as a learner, feels under attack or threatened in any way, they're bullied, they're teased by someone when they give an answer in a classroom, I'm putting a lot of pressure on them to, to do something. If, if we trigger negative emotions, the brain is trying to figure out how do I get to a safe place, a comfortable place, and feeling under threat. When the brain is feeling threatened, physiologically, children can't learn. So we need to keep in mind, negative emotions create a physiological barrier to learning. They trigger adrenaline and cortisol. The flip side of that is if I find what, what I'm learning interesting, relevant, I'm excited by it, we know that the, the transfer into long-term memory is much greater. So when children are engaged in learning, they find relevant and interesting, we increase the likelihood they'll remember that information. When they feel threatened or under attack in some way, it's less likely. Another piece we know is that intelligence is a function of experience, that children have to build based on something they have an understanding of, something they've experienced, that if there's no anchor for new learning, it's often going to be lost. And thirdly, and I've been stressing this already, we know that the brain stortively what is meaningful to the learner. So although I might find it meaningful as an adult, how do I help the child see meaning in it? Because the child is far more likely to remember and use information that they have established relevance. So note, for them, the learning environment has to be psychologically safe. Anything we do that helps to engage a student's, uh, in, to engage a student's emotional or motivational interest activates the adrenaline system, creates stronger memories. Now here's a flip side of that. 99% of everything, all the experiences we have in the day, the brain will drop. And that is important, by the way. So notice when I put here the brain is more like a sieve than a sponge. That's a normal, healthy, functioning brain. As you're listening tonight, I'm sure there are other distractions, a flickering light, someone walking by, uh, a noise. That, that, if what I'm saying to you is relevant, is, is helpful to you, you'll filter out some of those meaningless things unless the stimuli is too strong. Any given day, you are filtering out 99% of the stimuli coming into the brain to focus on what's important. The challenge, by the way, a couple of challenges. For children with ADHD, the difficulty they're having is filtering information. So all of those distractions that I meant that the normal brain would filter out, a child with ADHD is having trouble filtering them out. Imagine the frustration that that creates for a learner. When I can't filter information, everything coming in, my brain is keeping. It can be very, very difficult for a child. The other piece, and this is central to learning, if information is going to be retained and not dropped, then I have to fit it into some kind of existing memory category or network of neurons. If I can't fit this with something that I already understand, then it's more likely the brain will drop the information. But if I can make sense of it, if I can connect it to something, I'm more likely to retain it. If I can't, I'm more likely to drop it. By the way, this is why creating experiences for kids, um, using analogies with kids, helps them retain information. I want to give you a minute just to read what I just put on the screen, and then I'll comment on it. I'll give you a minute to read through. Just uh, uh, take that read through, and I'll, I'll come back in 30 seconds. Now, I suspect if I was face to face with you and I said, so tell me as much as you can about what you just read, most of you would struggle to tell me much of what you read. Because to you it was a bunch of nonsense, 
you're going to have trouble remembering the details. It didn't connect to something. It didn't fit into our, into our memory uh, networks of neurons or our memory categories. We can't connect that. By the way, I suspect for many children in our classes, um, in schools, that's what learning can often sound like. You know, the Charlie Brown won't law. They're hearing things that look much like this as they're learning about the War of Austria succession or some chemistry lesson or whatever it might be. And if, if we worked hard enough, we could store that in our memory. I could memorize this passage. I still wouldn't have any understanding what it is. I just memorized it. Okay? So I'm showing you this to kind of give you a sense of, of what, what children can encounter sometimes when things don't connect they can't make sense of. Now, by the way, my guess is many of you can make more sense of this than you realize. If I asked you, uh, what is Sarastana? People will tell me, well, I, it's a place. How do you know? Well, there's a capital letter telling me it's a proper noun. That it looks like Canada in a sense, so I think it's a place. And then there are Sarastanians, which would probably be the people. You could probably tell me which of those words are, are nouns and which of those words are verbs. And you can do that because you have an understanding of language. You have an understanding of the structure of language. So through inferencing, you can actually make some sense of this. Again, notice you've connected it to neural networks in the brain. Given a, an already existing understanding of nouns, verbs, and so on, you can make some sense of this. As children are building their understanding of language, that is not a neural network they necessarily have. So here's a few things that that it's important to understand about the, and these are, if you're raising a teen, by the way, we should clarify uh, the teen brain for girls, we're talking at this, uh, between probably 10, 11, 12 years old, it starts boys a couple of years later. One of the things is that we know the brain undergoes massive changes between 2 and 25 and doesn't really settle down until, until the early 20s. And there are a number of phases where the brain is being rewired in this, in this period. And what we as parents will often see as uh, being inconsistent and the risk taking and so on, I said earlier, is, is what the new research is suggesting is the brain, the teen brain being a work in progress. As, as teens start to find their way to independence, to test boundaries and so on. So a couple of things here. Um, I want you to note again that, that we should try to see and appreciate the teen brain as a highly adaptable brain moving from into a world that's more complex. And so essentially what the teen brain is doing is engaging in more complex behaviors while still at home, while still under the supervision of parents. So notice there's a bit of safety in that, and yet they're testing boundaries, so an important piece. Now, a couple of key things, and, and the next uh, bits I'm going to try to organize around four broad ideas. First, how do we learn in general? So learning, as I've just been stressing, is neurons making connections. So, so you have trillions of neurons in the brain. When activated, they fire an electrical impulse. That electrical impulse travels down the axon that you see on the screen where you see the blue circles. Uh, the electrical impulse triggers the release of a chemical, a neurotransmitter of some kind that drifts across and connects to the other neuron, and that's happening trillions of times in the brain. When new learning occurs, you're doing one of two things. You're growing new connections between the dendrites or you're strengthening them. We call this neuroplasticity, that as the brain is rewired, it is modeled, shaped by experiences in life. The more experiences the dense of the brain, the more the, the, the type of learning is experienced, the more we fire that axon, the stronger it becomes. So Pat Wolf, who, who is in California, uh, translating brain research and neuroscience into classroom practice. I like her phrase, she said, neurons that fire together wire together. If we help kids make connections, they're building those neural pathways, and if they make connections, they'll remember it better. I just throw in here this separate notion because you might be wondering, why is it I remember certain things with great clarity, um, even though I experienced them only once? Okay, and that's called the, the, the supercharged potentiation. So what we generally call, what I've been describing, is called long-term potentiation. Every time we fire that network, that neural network, along the same path, it becomes more efficient, it becomes stronger. Okay? Supercharge is when an emotional experience fires the entire brain and it just locks in the memory. So for example, 
uh, my mother knows exactly where she was when she heard of John F. Kennedy's assassination, okay, 50 years ago in her brain. I will remember, and I will always probably remember, where I was when I heard about 9-11, who was at the meeting I was attending, where I was sitting. It was one of those emotional moments that just fired the whole brain. I'm sure some of you have been at a performance, um, stood somewhere on vacation, had an experience with your children, that just fired the whole brain. It's a powerful emotional uh, uh, experience. So we talked about that. So what I want to just, as we move to the next piece, so learning is literally making connections. It's connecting new experiences with ones we already understand. It's building those neural pathways. Now, there's another phase called neural pruning. And if you pause and think for a moment, I've asked the question here, how and why is the behavior of an adolescent similar to that of a two-year-old? And my guess is that many of us at some point, being frustrated with a teen, may have told them to behave or acting like a two-year-old. And I want you to know, we, we say you're acting like a two-year-old. We don't say four-year-old or six-year-old. And there's a reason. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, oh yeah, the terrible twos. You know, if we stop and think, what's going on around that period in life? What's happening in the terrible twos? Well, what's happening is, keep in mind what I just mentioned. Every new sight, sound, experience, smell that a newborn baby has is it's growing new connections. So if we could hook up a newborn's brain and watch it firing, you would see it lighting up constantly. New connections, new connections, new connections growing. By about the age of two, the brain has actually become overly built. There are too many connections, and the brain has become inefficient. And it goes through, around the age of two, a major neural pruning process where it begins to prune back underutilized connections in the brain. And so one way to see that okay, is that what's happening much like a gardener in the spring brings back excess connections. What's left is a more refined and more efficient brain. So I use the David as an example because uh, if you've ever read the, the novel Agony and Ecstasy by Irving Stone, he's talking through the eyes of Michelangelo and he describes you know the artist creating a sculpture and what he points out or what what Michelangelo says in that novel is that in fact the artist doesn't create the form the form already exists within the marble and the artist the artist's job is to chip away the excess and let the form emerge and it struck me that as I learned about the teen brain that this is exactly what the teen brain is doing that Teens need to understand the brain is the only organ in the human body that is literally sculpted through how we experience life. You can damage your heart, you can damage your kidneys, you can damage your liver, but you don't shape or sculpt those. The brain is literally sculpted by what teens are doing. And, and by the way, when I said at two, the brain's going through a, a neural pruning process, what I failed to mention is that, again, in early adolescence, the brain goes through another major neural pruning process. This will begin in girls around 10 or 11. So in about grade 6, 7, you're seeing this neural pruning process. And in boys, a little bit later, and settling down usually around 15 or 16. So the, the most erratic period for most teens is probably going to be 12 to 15 years where there's this very erratic emotional ups and downs, huge swings, um, and so on. And then that settles down as the pruning process uh, finishes up. By the way, there, there's some research that suggests that there's a third time when this neural pruning process happens. And some of the research is suggesting that that's what we would typically call a midlife crisis, that the brain is going through a final reorganization. So note Jay Geed, uh, a neuroscientist with the Mental Health Institute in the United States. He said, if teens are doing music and sports and academics, that's how their brains are going to be hardwired. If they're doing video games and MTV and lying on the couch, that's how they're going to be hardwired. That what kids are doing during adolescence is very important to how they're sculpting what will become the adult brain. So I'm going to build on to a third piece. So step one, new experiences, practice, and so on, grows new connections in the brain. The more we practice, the more those get strengthened. By the way, I should have mentioned back here, let me just back up for a moment. 
I want you to pause and think for a moment when I said the brain cuts back underutilized connections. There's an important clue in there. The brain will prune back parts of the brain that are not being used. It's a use it or lose it approach. If as a teacher I see a student's job is to memorize large amounts of information, keep in mind that is not frontal lobe activity. The frontal lobes in our brain just behind your forehead are the part of the brain that deal with goal setting, problem solving, okay? critical thinking. That's the frontal lobes. Memorizing information is stored in the hippocampus. It's a different part of the brain. If I want to help my children become good thinkers, problem solvers, um, accountable young adults, I need to be working the frontal lobes of the brain. Okay? So note, we grow new connections, we prune back what's underutilized. My guess is many of you as parents, if you have children who play video games, if you've ever tried to take the controllers and try it out, we're often not very good. We haven't built the neural connections to allow us to have the success that kids have. My concern is, are, are they building that at the expense of what? Are they reading? Are they thinking? Are they making decisions on a regular basis? Are we working the frontal lobes? Here's the next step in this. So we build new connections. The brain then strengthens and prunes back what's underutilized. The next piece is myelination. Myelin is a fatty, waxy substance that wraps around the axon. So earlier we talked about neurons. If an electrical impulse travels down the axon, triggers the release of those chemicals. Well, myelin acts like an insulator on the axon. It's a fatty, waxy substance. So when we talk about gray brain or gray matter versus white matter, white matter's been myelinated. If you stop and think, look around you, somewhere in the, beside you, you'll find wires. We insulate electrical wires because electricity flows in a circular, sorry, in a, in a kind of a circular pattern along the wire. If two wires cross over each other, the signal will interfere, it will slow it down. So by insulating the wires, we increase the efficiency of the flow of that electrical impulse. That's exactly what's happening in our brains. By that myelin sheath wrapping around the axon, the electrical impulse fires 150 times faster. So if you stop and think, what can a colt do that your baby couldn't do when they were first born? Within an hour, the colt can get up and walk. Why? The cerebellum at the base of the brain at the back is responsible for gross motor movements, and it's fully myelinated in a horse at birth. Okay, so the horse has a cerebellum that's myelinated within an hour, it can coordinate, get up. The human child also has a cerebellum at birth, but it's not myelinated. So of course children have movement, but until that myelinates, they have difficulty coordinating and so on. The human cerebellum myelinates at about a year, and as it myelinates, the children get more efficient at using it. Now the myelination process appears to move from the base of the brain, at the back of the neck, forward with the last part of the brain to fully myelinate being frontal lobes. Okay? So what you are dealing with if you have a teenager at home is what we would say is an under-myelinated frontal lobe. And I used to say to my son when he was younger, Matthew, sometimes I'm going to be your frontal lobe because yours isn't fully myelinated. Do kids have a frontal lobe, teenagers? Yes. Can they make thoughtful, wise decisions? Absolutely. Will they do it as fast as you and I? No. They can think it through, but we have to guide them, we have to give them time. Put on the spot and pressured. The teenage brain, keep in mind there are two things at play here. One is it's going to fire 150 times slower than our brain. So they can make the decision, but they need time. And they've got a more emotional brain we're going to be talking about in a moment. So it's important to remember with teens, they can make good decisions, they can make thoughtful decisions, but they need our guidance. By the way, just loop back to what we just talked about, about the, about the process of pruning. If we were to say, well, teens don't have myelinated frontal lobes, so we shouldn't ask them to think and solve problems, then the frontal lobe is going to get pruned because we don't use it a lot and we don't strengthen it. Children from a young age need to be involved in problem solving, in thinking, um, in, in creativity, because these all strengthen the frontal lobes. 
as parents, we need to understand that they're not going to do it as efficiently as we are. By the way, any of you paying high insurance rates for teen boys, insurance companies know this research. Teenagers are 70 times more likely to get into an accident than adults because when encountering danger, uh, something runs out on the road in front, you hit an icy patch in winter, the teen brain panics because the emotional part of the brain hijacks it. The adult brain makes a quick, thoughtful decision in the frontal lobes and often avoids the accident. Okay? So this is the reality of the teen brain that you're dealing with, that the frontal lobes are not fully developed and so although they can make decisions, they often make, need time to do that. By the way, I'll just, uh, as you read through this slide, I'll just mention uh, one of the things that we know is that as the brain myelinates, it becomes more efficient. Okay? So I was saying that it fires 150 times faster, allowing it to carry out the functions that that part of the brain is designed for. It's a more efficient brain. But it also appears to become more rigid. So for example, if you learn a new language after the age of 13, chances are you're going to have an accent because the, the, the myelinated brain is better at using languages it's acquired but has more difficulty learning new languages and certainly struggles with the subtle nuances within a language. So we become better at carrying out the tasks that we've learned but we have more difficulty learning new tasks. So a couple of things as we, as we link myelination and adolescence. Note the last part of the brain was the frontal lobes. Okay? That's the last part and it allows the, the transition from childhood to adulthood as the brain's myelinating. A couple of other pieces, as teachers and as parents we play an important role in helping kids work through. By the way, note if we don't have, help them have clear expectations, if we don't hold them accountable, we don't nurture the mature adult brain. Kids need to have expectations, they need to be held accountable, we need to help them self-regulate. The corpus callosum is a bundle of nerves that connects the left side and the right side of the brain. We also know that that's involved in, in developing deeper thinking in kids. And, and I want you to note it's the connections across the brain, it's not whether you're left brain or right brain dominant, it's the connections made across that is more important in creativity and problem solving. Okay? The other thing we know, as I mentioned this earlier, the corpus callosum doesn't just control mo movement. We also know that the corp that that uh, sorry that the cerebellum I should have mentioned uh, is helping to coordinate thinking. I just want to bring this up. The cerebellum we we know is involved in coordination, but it also helps in the thinking process. That means one, teens might be clumsy, mentally clumsy as well as physically clum clumsy. But two, if your children are studying for an exam, sitting on the couch for three hours or on their bed trying to study is not as effective as spending 15 or 20 minutes on a body of information than getting up and pacing for a bit or walking the dog or doing something or even giving them a squishy ball or um, something in their hand to manipulate so that it triggers the cerebellum movement is important to help kids process information. So I'm just going to jump by this piece. Another piece we know is that the hippocampus is where the memories are formed and in girls the hippocampus develops faster and stronger so they often perform better on tests up until the early 20s. Uh, it helps them form a memory of the future. I can assemble memories from the past. And the other note I want you just to pay attention to at the bottom here Teens are often willing to accept the wisdom of adults if we're offering our advice as wisdom, but not as authority. So what's interesting is when we're working with teens, they're willing to listen to the wisdom that we've gained if it's being offered as advice to help them. But if it's being imposed as authority, then they struggle with, with accepting that. Through adolescence, as those frontal lobes, if we exercise them, work hard, by the way, give me a quick aside for a moment. When our son was younger, he'd say, what time do I need to be home? I would say to him, well, make me an offer. By the way, I knew full well what time limit I was willing to accept. But if I simply said to him, this is your curfew, he could be very compliant. He could be uh, very responsible, come home exactly when I told him. But he didn't have to do any of the thinking or decision making. 
when I'm no longer there and he's in his early 20s and he needs to make thoughtful decisions about his actions, if I haven't helped him practice that and think it through, he's not going to make good decisions. And so we would ask. He would say, what time should I be home? Make me an offer. He would say, how about 3 o'clock? I'd say, how about 10 o'clock? He'd say, well, Dad, that's not fair. I'd say, well, what time do you think your mother's going to go to sleep if you're coming home at 3 o'clock? Because she's not sleeping till you're home. Okay, so what might be a fair compromise? By the way, we get to that place where I was always come from the first place, but it was creating the conversation to work it through. Let me give you another quick example. When kids come home from school and we ask teenagers, so what did you do in school today? I can almost guarantee most of you out there saying they're going to say something like nothing. We've asked them for a list. We ask a list question. Tell me what you did in school today. Nothing. Because I don't really want to walk through telling you everything I did in school. Imagine if I said instead, tell me the most useless thing you did in school today. I suspect you would get kids starting to talk. And then I could pause it. Well, why do you think that was useless? Tell me the most useful thing you learned in school. By the way, what tell me everything you learned in school today is a recall, a memory, just tell me stuff. Tell me something useless you did, tell me something useful you did is a judgment. It's the frontal lobes. And it's a more interesting question for kids to respond to. A couple of key things. The more kids can can see in the learning emotional experiences, evocative experiences, the more likely it's transferred into long-term memory. The more we can move from concrete to abstract, move from experiences to thinking about the experience, to go on a field trip, to learn about it, come back and read more. The more kids can move from experience to abstract considerations, the deeper their learning will be. The more inquiry students use, the, the greater the strength of learning. Collaboration. The brain is a naturally social organ. It wants to interact. We want to share with people. Honor that. And give kids a chance to explore their interests and talents. I'm just going to jump by. I'm watching my time here. I wanted to show you uh, one last piece this evening, and that is I want to talk to you about emotions in the teen brain. And this will be the final piece. In the teen brain, there is a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala, which is a Latin word for almond, and it's spelled A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, -A, the amygdala, is the emotional sentinel in the brain. And as the emotional sentinel in the brain, the amygdala gives us I'm just going to pull this up for a moment. Uh, the amygdala, I'll pull that up, tells us how we feel about things. So when we encounter something, one neuroscientist put it this way. If the brain encounters something new, the first thing it does is to try to figure out, should I eat with it, mate with it, or run away from it? How do I respond to something new? The brain is built for survival. If it's a threat, I get to safety. If it's something that's useful, so our emotions kick in first. The other thing you need to know is that the amygdala is surrounded by testosterone sacs. So the teen boy brain, the male brain, the amygdala swells during adolescence. And so boys have an overly emotional brain. Now, we live in a society where boys appearing overly emotional is not cool to, to boys. So they don't want to show their emotions. And yet if any of you are raising a teen boy or raised a teen boy, you will know that if they break up with someone they're dating, it can be devastating. That if they're troubled, they really get emotional about it. By the way, this is why boys, if they don't find what they're learning in school to be interesting, relevant, helpful, they're less likely to complete the work. Girls are more likely to do the work, to get praise from a teacher, from the parent. Boys will do the work if they find interest and value in it. Boys have a highly emotional brain. Let me show you one, one other piece here. So a couple of things that we know. The reward center of the brain is active in adolescence. What does that mean? That there's still that the reward center, the pleasure center of the brain, they need to see relevance. The connection between the frontal lobes and the amygdala is still developing. So the emotional connection to the frontal lobes isn't fully developed as yet. So cognitive control over high risk. So kids thinking about should I engage in high-risk behavior? Our assumption is why would you think that through and what potential dangers are 
But if the emotional part of the brain has me excited and there's a weak connection to the frontal lobe, they don't necessarily weigh, as, as we might, the risk. And that's why, again, sometimes as parents, we have to make the difficult decisions. That, that again, another neuroscientist I read wrote that the, the biggest uh, problem with parents in North America today is the desire to be the child's best friend. And our job isn't to be their best friend. It's to help make sure they make it through adolescence alive and healthy. And sometimes that means making the hard decisions and saying no, because although their amygdala, their emotional part of the brain, really wants something, our frontal lobes are saying no, the danger, the risk is too high. And I want to show you one other piece, and I think it's a fascinating study. Teens, we know, don't read facial expressions well. So a group of teens and adults were, were involved in this study. They're, they were hooked up to an MRI scan. And they were showing a variety of images like this. And they were asked to report the emotion that they see. 100% of the adults reported seeing an emotion such as fear or related emotion to fear. 100% consistent. The teens were all over the map. They were not, not consistent with what they saw. So adults accurately read the, the facial expression very quickly. The teens did. Why? Because the teen brain on the MRI scans lit up in the amygdala in the emotional part of the brain. The teens had a gut reaction that often isn't very accurate. The adult brain lit up in the frontal lobes. Now remember, for all of us, when you saw that image, it first went to your amygdala, you quickly sorted out the details, and in a nanosecond, that information traveled from your amygdala to the frontal lobes. And you made a thoughtful or reasoned assessment of the image, whereas teens had a gut reaction. So what does this mean for us as parents? Well, often, and I'm sure many of you have had this experience, I approach my child with concern, they think I'm angry. So if they misread my facial expression, they get their back up, they start to push back. They're getting a bit aggressive, so I push back. This spirals down, it doesn't go anywhere healthy. If as adults we can recognize that teens often misread facial expressions, and sometimes, by the way, it's the reverse, that they laugh at inappropriate times, that sometimes the reverse will happen. But if I recognize this, then I can step out of that downward dance. I can, I can say, look, I'm not upset with you, but I do want to talk. Or maybe you can come back in five minutes, we could try this again. Or if they laugh at an appropriate time, not that I wouldn't hold them accountable, but I do have some understanding of that they may have actually saw humor in that. So I might need to point out why that was inappropriate. But helping us understand that often teens will, will think that we're angry when we're not, leading them to respond in a way that, that we didn't anticipate. And lastly, and I'll just finish here, emotion drives attention, attention drives learning. For working with your children as students, note our brains are, are, are programmed to tend to information that has strong emotional content and that we remember this information longer. This is key to understanding the teen brain. So I'm going to stop there, uh, turn that off. I think I went over a little bit, but not too bad. I, I'm hoping that, that there were bits and pieces in there that you found helpful. Might have answered some questions, raised more. Um, the, my, my part of my stress this evening was to, uh, to, to put an emphasis on the fact that the teen brain is developing, that kids can think and solve problems. In the second session that we'll do, uh, the intent is to, to begin to explore, so how do we interact with our kids in a way that supports that developing frontal lobe, that helps them become good critical thinkers, uh, which is increasingly what schools are looking for, increasingly what the workplace is looking for. So how can we as parents thinking team, and how can that help them both in school? I'm going to turn things back to Josh. Thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, I hope uh, there was some useful information uh, for you in that. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Garfield. Um, we have our, my colleague Barb, and she's just going to ask you she's going to ask you a few questions that people have asked. Barb? Great. Uh, thanks, Josh, and uh, thank you for the uh, uh, excellent presentation. Um, we have uh, a couple comments on the line, uh, basically um, thanking you for uh, the advice that it's very helpful, and uh, wanted to uh, thank you for that. Uh, there is one question about um, looking at starting school later in the morning for teens uh, because, you know, perhaps they need more sleep. Has, is this something that, um, you know, that uh, has ever been tried or considered for this age group? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me give a little bit of context to that. Uh, melatonin is the neurotransmitter that's released in our brain. Uh, it, it's uh, probably for some of us within the next hour, you're going to start feeling, uh, getting tired. You're going to start feeling like, oh, I need to get ready for bed. Uh, because melatonin sends a signal to the brain that it's time to wind down. And, it, and for most of us, that, that's released around uh, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, if somewhere in there. For some reason, and sleep researchers aren't quite certain why, I'll tell you a speculation in a moment, but in the teen brain, melatonin is released one to three hours later. So for teens, uh, they're just, they're not tired. The, if the melatonin hasn't been released, and the best example I can give you is if you fly across time zones, your brain doesn't adjust for a few days, and while it's adjusting, the, the, if my melatonin has been released, it could be two o'clock in the morning where I am now, I'm just not feeling tired. So many of you may have had teens where you said, you know, you've got a big test tomorrow, you need to get to bed early tonight. And they say, well, I, I just, I can't, I just lay, I lay weak sleeping. Because the melatonin hasn't been released. Uh, now, by the way, if your teen then says, so I think I'll go play some video games. That's a bad choice because the, the flashing lights, the adrenaline rush of playing the video games is going to keep them awake longer. Uh, reading a book, listening to music softly, you know, there are some things they can do to help with that. Um, but let me go back to directly to your question. If the melatonin is released one day later, it also wears off one to three hours later. So you, you might notice, uh, I, if I set my clock for 7 o'clock in the morning to wake me up, I still wake up every day around 6.15 anyway. I would, you might, the melatonin as it release off, releases uh, or wears off, I come out of the sleep that I was in. For teens, that melatonin is wearing off one to three hours later. So when we have early school start times, they're really not kind to the teen brain. And, and as a result, you know, kids go to school, class starts, say, at 8.30 in the morning. The melatonin is still lingering. So if, if they're sitting in a class, we turn the lights down, show them a video, they're back to sleep. So this is a very good question that later school start times are better for the adolescent brain. It's not just that they need more sleep, it's that they, they're not sleeping well at 10 o'clock or 11. So many of them are falling asleep at 12 or 1 o'clock. The research shows that, that teens are most sleep deprived segments of North American society. So uh, honoring that, and some schools have moved to later start times, to 9.30 or 10 o'clock with later end times. Now, there are social and economic implications of that, but from a learning perspective, there's no question uh, that later start times are better for teens. And, and one other quick, quick note, if your teen's out really late on a Friday night, for example, sleeping in till 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and Sunday is actually harder on the brain because then Monday I've got to get back into the other. Teens would be better getting off relatively similar times all, every day. So if I get up at 6.30 during the week, still try to get up at 8 or 8.30 on the weekend and then have a nap in the afternoon if you're tired. But having those dramatic shifts in sleep patterns makes it more difficult for them. So that, you know, what we should be doing is trying to have fairly consistent sleep patterns. Sorry, that's a bit longer than the question, but there are some pieces related there. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, there's one more question here um, just around, uh, can girls study better together? Um, is, this, is there an advantage for girls to learn in group situations? <sighs> Interesting question. Um, certainly, um, I mean, I think it does require certain uh, self-regulation and discipline that the, so I have to answer this with the potential is certainly there that, that they're helping each other through the learning. If there's a lack of discipline and they're unfocused, then, then there's going to be more distraction. So um, if there's a focus and a common goal, yes. Um, I find a lot of teens, and, and I'll tell you where I think it actually works surprisingly well is through social media, that four friends on Facebook, and as they're studying through, they're posting questions, there tends to be less of the, the social distraction in that, but, but certainly I think social media has become a way that, that students who are serious about studying can meet three other students online. I, I'm stuck on this question, this idea, can someone help me out? So I think there's certainly a way that social media plays a, a helpful role there. And as I said, if the, if the girls are coming together with some focused questions and, and, and they're targeted, um, that will certainly, there is benefits from the collaboration. Uh, 
By the way, one other just quick note, now that I've mentioned social media, uh, when your children are doing homework, there's a myth of multitasking with teens. The teens, and it kind of fits my comment about kids working together if they're not focused. Kids think they're good multitaskers, but they, they actually task switch. Multitasking is doing two tasks simultaneously. And that would be, for example, talking on my cell phone while driving. And you notice we've banned that because we know it doesn't work. Teens, to be truly multitasking, would be typing their essay on the one hand and responding to a Facebook posting with the other hand. That would be multitasking. That's not what teens do. They task switch. They move from one task to go to the other, they come back. That is also somewhat inefficient. So my advice to parents would be, if your child wants to use social media, then what they should be doing, give them a tech break. I want you to do focused homework for 30 minutes. Then take 15 minutes, go on to Facebook. Then come back and do your homework. Don't switch back and forth. It's inefficient. Focus your study. Focus on your homework. Give yourself a break. Come back. That's a much more efficient way. And by the way, for their friends and so on, they'll have more efficient responses. But a much more efficient way for the team brain not to divide its attention. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we're uh, out of time for questions, but um, um, some uh, some great questions here on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Garfield. Um, this was a phenomenal presentation, and for everybody, to please note again that this session has been recorded. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, Hopeland CPIC, and uh, with all the other webinars that we have done so far. It should be there in the next few days if you would like to see it again or if you would like to share it with a friend or with a family member. Please also note that on Monday, May 26th, we are having Cyberbullying and Electronic Safety webinar. Uh, when, uh, Tuesday, June the 3rd, we're having Internet Safety and Social Media webinar. Thursday, June the 5th, it's the second part of here tonight, the Team Brain. Wednesday, June the 11th, is the Ontario College of Teachers. And June the 16th or the 18th, we haven't nailed it down yet, is K2 Math and Numeracy. So I'd like to thank everybody tonight for uh, um, logging on and being with us during this presentation. And please, um, please take note that in a couple of weeks, you will get uh, an email like you will receive an email for this, which has the registration um, items on there that you can just click and you can register at that time. So uh, that will be coming to you. Again, Dr. Garfield, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank again Barbara Belanger, Lisa Coster, and Rosemary Stagg for helping out tonight. And everybody have a great evening. Thanks, Josh.